Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to continue our interview series. And today, I'm very happy to have a China specialist uh, based in China, Mr. Frank Zierin, with me. Frank, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, a short yeah. intro. GBP International is a company I'm running. I have founded this company about 22 years ago. We are consulting and cooperating with European companies on their way to Asia, and we try and help them to solve their problems, whatever that is, uh, whether it's uh, management or interim assignments, restructuring, procurement. But I don't want to do a sales talk here. I want to talk with Frank. Frank, very welcome to this uh, session. Maybe you can start yourself also with a one minute pitch, uh, who you are, what you have been doing, what your focus is before we go into the, into the discussion. It's actually very simple. I arrived in uh, summer uh, 1994 in Beijing. I only wanted to stay a few months. And since then I'm, I'm living in, um, in China. I'm a journalist, book author, and I'm specialized on China. And um, now I'm in Germany, kind of a China specialist because I'm long enough in the country, hanging around in the country. And I'm still curious about all these new developments. And I'm pretty sure that the next 20 years will be even more spectacular than the last 20 years. So um, I, I'm gonna stay. <laughs> Excellent. And I think it is very important to really have people on the ground with uh, boots on the ground, so to say, because we all know that media is overhyping many situations for, uh, yes. eye for getting eyeballs, so to say. So very often, it doesn't, very often. Yeah, it doesn't have to be boots. It can be flip flops as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are you're in a privileged situation because the weather is much nicer in these days. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But Frank, let's get serious a little bit. I mean, if we if we talk China and I want to focus today a little bit on the let's say the perception we get here in Germany and in Europe when we open the, the newspapers or the Internet. And um, there is still the, the topic of the US-China trade conflict, which was starting basically many, many years ago. Many people didn't know, but it be became more, more obvious and more public when Donald Trump uh, came into power and he really escalated, yes. escalated it with uh, uh, penalties and customs duties, et cetera. So where, where are we today from, from your point of view? And after Joe Biden Thank took you. over, is there actually, any we are, yes, actually, we are much better off than with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, um, and even I, I, even the American Republicans um, start to see now that this uh, the strategy of Donald Trump was kind of a de dead end strategy. And um, Joe Biden is focusing in a completely different direction um, where when when um, Donald Trump was basically trying to exclude China from the world, uh, make sure that they have no access to technology. Biden is going into another direction. He's saying, okay, if China is becoming stronger and stronger, we need to become competitive again. Mm -hmm. That's a completely different perspective. That does not mean that um, the tension is going to go away or that all, tra all tariff barriers will fall um, next month when they meet at uh, on the G20 level, but it's much more uh, relaxed than it was um, during um, uh, time uh, the time of uh, President uh, um, Trump. And you can see already the way things are changing. Joe Biden is clearly saying that he's not interested in the Cold War. Um, um, he he allowed end of August. Uh, um, uh, to uh, the South uh, Chinese technology enterprise Huawei to buy uh, computer chips, mm -hmm. even if it's generally uh, forbidden. But uh, this was a deal worth uh, several hundred million US dollars, so quite a big deal. Mm -hmm. So you, you see his more flexible approach. And uh, last week, big surprise, um, uh, the, the, the daughter of the founder of Huawei, uh, Ms. Meng, she could uh, go home. Basically, yeah. the, 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 the whole case is gone. Yeah. And there also, was no the penalty. Canadians, also the two Canadians who have been also detained. Also the two also Canadians. Released, yes. Yes. 
The two Canadians were released. They had to stay in a prison, unfortunately, whereas uh, Ms. Meng could stay in her own house in house arrest. Uh, this was a bit unbalanced, but um, the problem is solved. You see this step by step. They're, they're, they reached um, really interesting agreements on the climate change level. John Kerry was here uh, three weeks ago. And after the visit of John Kerry, uh, Joe Biden and President Xi Jinping were talking to each other on the phone. And after that, Xi Jinping announced that they're not going to go, that they're not going to say uh, uh, sell uh, um, coal power plants to um, um, one belt, one road initiative yeah. countries anymore. Yeah. Um, that's a very big step. And that's quite painful for um, China because it's it was quite a uh, big business, big business for them. For yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But so, that, that shows that both sides are able to um, to work with, with each other despite the, the, uh, the biggest differences you still have. And the, uh, and the differences will probably stay big. And in some areas, they will even become bigger um, mm. because China will become stronger and stronger and relatively the United States are going to lose power. And this is um, normally, this is not happening without frictions. Normally in former times, it would be a war. Mm -hmm. And lucky us, both countries are so civilized that it's actually quite unlikely that uh, this power fight will fought through a war, but rather through a more civilized way of competition through mm -hmm technology competition well, that's through, interesting. through economic yes to economics well that's, mm, well that's a very let's say positive statement and i'm very happy to yes. hear to hear your judgment that we are having a phase of let's say de-escalation so to say yes. and yes. are moving into the right direction but as you say china will certainly not go away and we have to face the fact that china is going to stay there as a more and more competitive competitor uh, in all and, and, kinds of areas. And we tend to forget that China is already the second biggest um, um, uh, 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 economy in the world, or even if you, um, if, you, uh, if you count in PPP terms, it's even the biggest already. But no. um, the per capita income is still lower than Romania. Yeah. And that, 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 is... that tells us something about um, how much development, how much growth potential growth, because you you can't say for sure how China is going to develop, but the potential growth is still very, very high. And all the innovations we see right now coming out of China, this is only, only the beginning. This is only the warming up yeah. of a country which used to be a very, very innovative country. It then had uh, a lot of trouble for about 150 years and now basically is getting back to to no, to the normal uh, um, way of developments in you its very, history. Yeah, you make a very interesting point, and that's also what we always encounter. You know, you you really have to see the historical perspective of yes. China if you want yes. to understand where China is going uh, and where China wants to go. You know? and for them, yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. whether we have to wait one, five, or ten years. The general direction is, for me, it's very clear. You know, and uh, yes. China is not going to go away. You know. And from from a Western perspective, the the Chinese politics right now um, look quite strange because on one side, they tend to very very strong control. They're enforcing the control and the surveillance. On mm -hmm. the other side, they are enforcing innovation. Yeah. And actually. Actually, from our perspective, you can't have it both, Con more control and more innovation. Mm. But actually, in, uh, from a Chinese point of view, you can have it actually for quite a while. And um, that they both focusing on these two um, areas of politics, uh, you can easily explain if you look at the history. Then. Because in the 19th century, the Chinese government um, the emperors lost control because they missed out in a huge innovation innovation wave, we can say. Uh, this was the Industrial Revolution. They were basically too stubborn, too arrogant, 
to understand the importance of this innovation movement at the other end of the world yeah. and actually they lost control over the country because they haven't been innovative enough then the economy went down mm -hmm. and actually now it's the other way around now we are in europe uh, probably too stubborn and too arrogant to see the importance of the innovation coming from asia mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll wake up soon enough and then um, basically uh, try to face this competition and try a realistic approach um, about this new player coming up yeah. and the multipolarian world order. Because one thing is clear, um, these centuries of um, the minority of the West setting the rules for the majority of the world, this period is actually over. We don't know how fast it is over, but the direction is 100% clear. We are facing a multipolarian world order where the West is only one part of one of the decisive groups. Um, and there will be a lot of power moving to Asia and especially in Asia to, to China, but not only to China. Yeah. We also forget to forget to um, see the, the, the other countries around growing. Yeah. Well, I can't agree more with you. And I think this is what we are also trying to convey as a message for the last 20 years. You know, you have to be in China to be a global player. And if you miss yes. out China and the other Asian countries, which are also not small, you know, they have also, look at India, Indonesia, these are hundreds of right. people, economies. Um, so if you are not in China, you are really missing something. And I mean, the last two years, see, I'm talking about COVID now. This was a perfect example how China was handling it and how yeah. the European countries, especially Germany, was handling it. And this is also putting a magnifying glass on the different system uh, and the different understanding of what a society should be. Talk about freedom, talk about rights, talk about data protection, uh, personal data issues. And this cannot be solved. You know, there is no either or. And uh, China is doing it her way and uh, Germany did it uh, the German way. Uh, and you see the results, you know, so, and uh, you have written yeah, a book totally. about, uh, yeah, you have I, written a book I totally about, agree, yeah. yeah, you have written a book about Shenzhen, you know, being the new Silicon Valley, and I have been to Shenzhen myself before COVID broke out, and it's just mind-boggling, you know, and I can only yes. tell people, look, if you really want to talk about China, spend five days in Shenzhen, and then, then you come and talk again, you know? so mm. and uh, the, yes, dominance, sure. the dominance of the chinese uh, tech companies in china is now also being regulated you know because the government also says look uh, it can't go that way forever so we have to put some strict rules into it so that they comply with our uh, policies and directives yeah? how do you judge uh, this this move by the chinese government to make a tighter control on the tech companies Basically, the way they're doing is, uh, it's a bit bumpy. Um, it's uh, probably not so much on the elegant side, but probably it's the same way like a father with a bunch of kids saying now, next week, no TV. And at the end of the day, it's, that, it's only one day of uh, uh, yeah. no TV. So they, they need to raise this voice in this big country. But the way they did it was not really uh, yeah. elegant, as I said. but. Generally, I agree um, to the point of view that those big tech players need some rules. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, actually, China should have implemented these rules earlier. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, very, very important is that these rules are leveling, level playing field, that these rules are the same for every player. Mm -hmm. But basically, with these uh, new rules, China is making sure that n that more smaller players can compete. Mm. Before, it was um, basically a quite um, bad development into a direction of a monopoly where one player or two players were so strong that they basically bought all the new players off the market and then they decided what to do with them yeah. um, uh, either let them die or make them grow mm. so this is not possible anymore and then 
Um, the, the second thing is that they had some business models which were able to basically derail the whole Chinese financial system. I talk about Ant Financial and the micro credit system, which was uh, for the, uh, quite dangerous for the stability of the country. Um, and the, the Chinese government basically want to avoid a situation like in 2008, 2009 in America, yeah. um, where um, some ruthless banks uh, basically created the collapse of the whole finance system. Yeah. So, a, so talking, um, talking about talking about collapse, yeah. uh, there are two yes. interesting uh, subjects coming to my mind. One is the the recent ban on the cryptocurrencies, which was uh, yeah. decided last week. That sent a big yes. shockwave, and I think the rationale behind it you just described. You know, China just wants to keep control. That things are yes. not able to move out of uh, control and management and supervision by by the ruling parties. And the second one is a topic you also have been addressing in the media. This is the, the property company Evergrande, which is uh, yes. maybe collapsing. Uh, maybe you can uh, say a few words about the crypto ban and uh, the property scandal with Evergrande. The, the cryptocurrencies, the, the, the story is very simple. Uh, with these cryptocurrencies, it was able to bring money out of the country. Mm. And uh, um, uh, the Chinese government uh, wants to have control how much money is leaving the country. Why? Because they saw in the Soviet Union and the four, and then in Russia how uh, billions and billions left the country and the, the government couldn't, couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, they um, want tight controls about... Uh, how much money is getting in, how much money is getting out. And if you have the cryptocurrencies, you, you don't have any control anymore. That's mm -hmm. a very simple reason, understandable. Yeah. And um, actually, because this is uh, very, very important to keep a um, economy stable, um, that you make sure that there's no overlending or, um, or, the, or overborrowing abroad and then mm -hmm. Uh, something happened like in the Asian crisis uh, 1997, where uh, many Asian countries were over borrowing in the US dollar, but producing in their, in their local currency and suddenly mm. um, uh, the foreigners wanted their money back and then they couldn't yeah. pay because the currencies went down. Yeah. And basically what China wants to do to avoid this, to create more stability. Um, the second, the second uh, case, Evergrande is um, 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 same but different. Basically, the government changed the rules for real estate enterprises that changed the rules how much cash reserve they must have. Mm. They changed the rule how much money state-owned banks can lend to this real estate enterprise. Mm. And it, they did this beginning of the year and it was pretty clear mm. that um, Evergrande is not gonna jump no. over this new fence. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, we and read, they, basically, they, it was it was not a collapse which was surprising the government, but actually it was a collapse which was initiated by the government. Mm -hmm. And and um, um, are, you're saying they are it, managing it somehow. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's actually not big enough to collapse the whole real estate market or mm -hmm. the whole economy. Um, yeah. Evergrande has only 4% market share, one of the biggest players, but there are lots of players. And the market share of real estate in GDP is only 14%. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's not a is, systemical risk. Yeah. risk, it's only a risk about, uh, uh, it's a risk for this enterprise and for the yeah. investors in this enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually another very interesting case study, so to say, you know, when we look at the facts and the figures of Evergrande, as you have just described them. And then if we just open the news the last two weeks in the media, it was like China is going to collapse, the stock market will burst, you know, everything will be in tears and shatters because of Evergrande. But if we hear from the horse's mouth, or if you look at the data, we say, Obviously, China is so big, I mean, it's a big player or reasonable player, but it will not uh, be a systemic risk and things will play out, you know. And, and that, is, that, is a pattern, yeah. that is a pattern we yeah. see, you know, 
And there yeah. are so many other and examples. Even, yeah, and even if you are not an um, economic specialist, you should immediately know that the stress test um, uh, they had to survive by Corona was a hundred times bigger <laughs> than the stress test they had to they had to face uh, with uh, the collapse of one yeah, of yeah. one real estate enterprise. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but it's a problem that um, people in the West they have this kind of strange fear that China could become too strong and they could lose influence. Mm. And, and this fear is actually, um, it's, it's, it's actually a bit too big. Mm. Instead, we should, we should um, face the challenge and we, first, I, we should also... stay competitive. Exactly. That's, that's very important. Instead of uh, starting uh, China bashing and trying to put China into a corner, we are anyways, we are not strong enough to corner China, mm -hmm. even if Europe and America would work together. That's yeah. too late. China is ready too big. Yeah, so I if think... you can't corner China, you need to compete yeah. and you need to be better. You need to yeah. um, be successful, more successful. Yeah. But of that, course, many and, and people... Many people will yeah. counter your argument. Yes, we have no problem to, to compete, but on a fair level playing field. And then, of yes, course, but... we come to the topic of uh, yes. Chinese government subsidies, you know, yes. Chinese government yes. company being sponsored with each and everything. Um, so it's yes. a difficult discussion, but I share your view that in many cases, China, from the Western point of view, is also serving the function of being a scapegoat, you know, for... Yes. For everything which Business. is not working, whether yes. we have not sufficient yeah. face mask here or not sufficient right. vaccination or the coronavirus was invented by China uh, intentionally. So China serves a very nice uh, metaphorical scapegoat for many problems which are not properly addressed in the West. You know? Yes, yes. And um, economy, it's always about rules, but also always about power. Mm. And sometimes sure. the power are stronger than the rules. <laughs> and that's not only working for China, it's working for America. It's yeah. even working within Europe. Did you yeah. ever see a e e uh, ICE train in France? No, mm. they have their own trains. So of the course. market is closed for, for, yeah. for, for, for German trains. That's very Unfortunately, true. they have been stupid enough to compete with their two, two train systems in China. And then they were outplayed by China. And now... Uh, in China, the high-speed trains are Chinese mm -hmm. because yeah. they took over Perfect. all the technology. Obviously. So it, we have to stay realistic. Yes, it would be very nice if there would be a level playing field, mm. if there would be the same um, uh, rules for foreigners than you have for um, Chinese. Mm. But realistically um, speaking, every country tries to protect its markets. And if you're a strong country, you have more, you have more, more power. stronger power to, to, to protect yourself. That's, yeah. that's how the way, that's how life goes. Yeah. Economic I, just life. Want to, I just want to give you yeah. an interesting example from one of our recent projects. We, we have a, a client and they are manufacturing high-tech products in China, which the Chinese competitors are not able to produce at the moment. So now, because of this buy local policy in China, the customers from China come to my customer and say, look, I want to buy your high tech products, uh, but I'm not allowed to because you are 100% wholly owned foreign company in China. So can I become a 5 or 10% shareholder of yes. the company so that yes. I'm technically allowed to be your customer? And so these are very interesting scenarios. Yeah. Um, and actually very, very pragmatic scenarios. And that's actually a very important uh, way of dealing with China is mm. finding, not complaining about the rules, but finding smart ways around it. And actually okay. around the rules, uh, which are also coping with the interest of uh, China. It's not about mm. corruption. It's not about um, undergoing Chinese rules, but it fi it, it's, it's about finding common ways um, uh, with the foreign investor and the ch Chinese yeah. enterprise to, to, yeah. to, to do business. And that's actually quite interesting challenge. And sometimes that's a very quite creative, yeah. quite, quite creative solutions. 
Yeah, talking very casual, I think that is the most common uh, hurdle to overcome, you know, because especially yes. the large companies in Germany, they are ruled by the legal departments. And uh, yes. if, if the rules are not properly in place and not accepted by the legal uh, security check, then nothing will happen. Whereas yes. you say from your experience, and I, I cannot agree more, the Asians in general say, okay, I like you, I have a drink with you, let's do something tomorrow. And we will find yes. out what is the best way forward as we go along. But this, yes. this is not a good uh, business plan for any German company, you know? Yes, yes. And it's actually, there are good ways to bypass the rules with, without becoming illegal. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a very important. That's of a course. very important game yeah, uh, yeah. to be uh, to, to to stay successful in China, and that's very complicated to explain <laughs> to a German-trained lawyer, uh, exactly. um, and which you is can't not write familiar that. with this kind of way. Yeah. And you can't write it down. You know, you can't produce a handbook. Yes. You know, because every case yes. is very different. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'd like to change subjects a little bit um, because one of the other main topics which we see in the news is the China Belt and Road Initiative with many, yes. many reports about what is going right, what are the impacts, is it a tool for new colonization efforts because obviously the bad examples are being shown uh, like China being bribing the president and then taking over the harbors and the airports and the gold mines and basically uh, extracting all assets from a very weak country. Um, but we also hear news now that there is a new level where we say it's uh, not only a physical digital road, uh, digital, not only a physical Belt and Road Initiative, but also a digital Belt and Road Initiative where everything is going to be connected via the, the internet, via e-platforms. Um, what's, your, what's your latest take on that one? Uh, that's a very um, that's a very wide uh, wide field. So, um, right, tell me, me on me, what should I me, focus? Let me focus. <laughs> what is how should Germany address the China initiative of the digital belt and road now, which is like a version 2.0 of the first phase? Because I think honestly, the first phase is more or less done. You know, being physical, yes. being in terms yes. of building railway lines. You should join it. We should join it if it's in our interest. Mm. We should implement our ideas of um, rules of this game. Yeah. But we should sit and discuss uh, discuss with the Chinese. We should mm. not uh, lean back and criticize. Mm. If we don't like something, then let's sit together with the Chinese and make it better. Mm. Or yeah. uh, propose alternatives to the uh, countries which are involved. Yeah. And I, I, if the countries have more than one choice, that's much better for these countries um, mm. if they only have one choice and we are standing at the sideline and uh, complaining. Yeah. So exactly. I think yeah. we, meet, we, we need to, we need to um, start to get on the ground and we mm. need to stop to talk theoretically about this kind of initiative. What does it mean and what are the risks and mm. what are the the disadvantages yeah. we need projects we need cooperation we need discussions mm -hmm. that's very very important yeah i tell you my my little share of experience because the big difference is the china belt and road initiative was about physical investment you know there is a country mm -hmm. say in africa china comes along and i build you a new airport i built you a new harbor here is 500 million dollars and 5,000 workers and you get it ready in two years from now. Uh, can you think of any German or even European company who is able and willing to do the same? I can't. They want to sell their equipment. And if there is no paying customers, they go somewhere else. I think that is a, yes. a, a short summary about the totally different mindset, the, the, the totally different uh, concept of minds, uh, what this means. But I mean, we can talk for, for hours about this. Uh, let's uh, jump a little bit to more the, the German perspective on how Germany is dealing in and with China. And uh, one of the key figures is stepping down now. As you know, we will have a chancellor uh, who is not uh, called Angela Merkel. And uh, I'm sure <laughs> China has been observing very closely the election results and they are preparing 
their diplomatic mm -hmm. circles for whoever is running the new government. Um, what's, a, what's a quick take of the Chinese reaction to the German election result and the potential outcome of a, of a coalition? The problem is um, the results are not really clear enough to talk about it. It's uh, basically, we don't know if uh, um, the chancellor will come from the socialist or from the conservative party, uh, which, which is the party of Angela Merkel. Um, that's all open. We don't know uh, the real strengths of the smaller coalition partners. We see now recently that they start to work together, the liberals and the Green Party. Um, if they unify, they are much stronger. But I personally, I have no idea about the outcome of these elections. And probably it will take quite a while yeah. um, until we know who will be the next chancellor. Mm. I, I think from a China perspective, both possible uh, uh, solutions, um, Mr. Scholz from the Social Democrats and um, Mr. Laschet from the Conservative Party, they are basically known for a quite pragmatic, um, realistic approach um, towards China. And um, the reason behind it that uh, the German economy and the Chinese economy are uh, quite deeply interlinked. Mm. And so um, you basically need a pragmatic approach. But that's actually all right now, uh, one can say. Um, because um, we, 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 we don't know uh, which role China is going to play in the uh, coalition negotiations. Uh, that's far too early. Yeah, I think that is also a result of, let's say, the campaign of the last two or three months. I mean, we are kind of, I call ourselves a little bit more insider than the average uh, observer because you are living there and dealing with Asia for many years. But I have not heard the name of how do we deal with Asia and China during the election campaign. And the, the importance of that relationship is, to me, not visible, uh, even though it should be. Ah, um, I think the reason, the... yes, I think the reason it was not mentioned so often, it was actually mentioned, but not so often, is that it's for a politician in an um, election campaign Hmm. It's a it's a minefield actually, yeah, and because China, if you China if is you're, not voting, yes, China is not voting, and if you're too if you're too tough, uh, then the business is not happy. If you're yeah. too soft, um, um, the civil society is not happy. So it, and this is completely different um, as it is in uh, in the United States where Trump actually did strong part of his election campaign he did uh, um, um, against China um, yeah. but we are not in a superpower position so we are not uh, the fear of losing our superpower pos position is not as big because we are not a superpower yeah. Yeah. so um, then but then it gets more complicated mm. and therefore the politician um, tend to to avoid the topic, the China topic, mm, yeah. because it's actually too complicated for mm. uh, 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 simple election campaigns. Yeah, I also think, in general, I have been asked by my Asian friends what is going to happen. I think we could agree, whoever is going to be the chancellor, there won't be much and no drastic changes in the way Germany yes. and Asia has been dealing yes. with each other. And yes. I think that is true yes. for all countries in Asia. Germany is going to yes. stay a stable and reliable partner. We honor yes. our commitments and contracts. So I don't see any drastic changes coming, whoever is going to run the government. You know. One big problem we are facing with the elections in France, mm. because if uh, there's a little chance that the right-wing party is taking over, Le Pen, mm. the daughter, and they, um, they, they definitely ha will have a different approach. Mm. And then um, the problem is, uh, how China politics are going to develop on the European level. Because for Europe, very, it's very, very important that France and Germany agree on each other. And, um, well, uh, and if they are... 
if if they if this is not working anymore, this will be a bigger um, mm. a bigger problem. No, but not so, only um, for China, for the whole of Europe. I think that will cause a big yes. uh, conflict. Yes, yes. Yeah. But yeah. also for 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 the position for for Germany within Europe will be more complicated Definitely. because uh, the general position now uh, uh, between Macron and Merkel is uh, pretty similar. Mm -hmm. So they agreed, uh, for example, to uh, put through the investment agreement on European level. They do agree that sanctions are probably not the most uh, smart method mm -hmm. to make sure that China is doing what we want. Mm -hmm. um, and so on and so on. Um, so uh, therefore, we need to wait until um, March after the election in France. And if the elections going um, in favor, ending in favor of mm. Macron, and then we would have either Scholz or Laschet, then it would be quite stable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, now we are talking about the, the general level of, let's say, the, the, the government, the heads of government, uh, diplomatic relation, how are the policies aligned or uh, adjusted. Um, that is all important and, and good to talk about. But let's break it down a little bit on the, uh, the business level and of the actual cooperation. And we have seen a lot of, let's say, as an example, Chinese investments into Europe, especially Germany. They are going down now the last uh, two, three years for a number of reasons. But do you have hands of hands on experience where you talk to managers from Chinese investors who acquired a company in Europe or uh, even in Germany? What is their take? Is it working? I mean, we see many cases where we have very good. Yes, I know. Where I, uh, this, it, the relationship is going sore and having tensions. What's what's your experience with the feedback you get? At the end, it's not so much about the countries, but uh, the, the, it's about the human beings doing business. About, business is That's about a very people. important. Yeah, for example, um, 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 uh, um, there's there's some joint ventures. The uh, Chinese on the Western side, they have different ideas. They're sleeping in the same bed, but they have different dreams. And it's difficult to work together. There are others that work very well because um, um, the German uh, probably hidden champion knows on the long run they cannot succeed without cooperating with China. So mm -hmm. then they decide to find a Chinese partner who's helping them uh, to enter the or to develop the Chinese market. So um, there are no general rules, but you can yes. say there's one trend um, it's very unlikely that a Chinese enterprise is buying a German enterprise and then taking over all the intellectual property and move everything to China. That the normal, the, yes, the, the normal way. way is, yes, the normal way is they buy a German enterprise because they uh, are, are impressed by the German innovation by the German engineers, the way they do it. So, and it would be stupid to move these engineers to China. You, you wouldn't even be able to move them to China against their will. So um, that's actually a fear, which is uh, not very realistic. Normally, if they invest, they're gonna, even they're gonna expand in Europe because they also need the uh, sales network Exactly. They need yeah. the marketing experience, they need the engineers, they need even need um, the production know-how in Europe and not back in China. Mm -hmm. But do you see that there will be a revival of Chinese outbound investments into Europe? Because, I mean, we see quite some drastic declines uh, from the peaks. Uh, yes. Uh, of Basically, focus on their home market and the Asian, Asian neighbors in the ASEAN region. As an alternative, basically, the, yes, basically, it was a different um, period of time when President Xi Jinping was saying, Now, um, dear Chinese enterprise, go and conquer the world. Mm -hmm. So they all went out and they all took lots of money out of the country, and there were not so many results. The results were a bit disappointing. So, therefore, Xi Jinping was saying, No, that's not the way I thought about it. Um, so please bring your money back and we should only invest in strategically important industries 
mm. probably uh, where it's too expensive or it takes too much time or it's too small to build up their own industry. And um, on the other side, um, the uh, Chinese politicians decided to strengthen, to strengthen their own research and development, mm. saying, why should we buy a German enterprise? Let's invest five years, a lot of money. Let's, yeah. probably, let's probably buy some of the best engineers mm. and then let's build it up ourselves. I mean, that's, that a, is... that's a different perspective, but still, if you have a very technology intensive and very specialized enterprise in Germany, uh, the Chinese uh, um, would still uh, be interested in, in in buying it because it probably it's less mafan you say in China it's less trouble um, to just buy these bits of know-how yeah. than to yeah. develop it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned a very interesting point, and that is let's say the level of technology or the level of competitiveness in the high tech. Uh, demanding uh, industry sectors and we see that in many of our studies that over let's say the last 20 years there's a very clear pattern you know that uh, initially the chinese goods were only low quality and very cheap uh, so the german companies were not really concerned because they're saying you are comparing apples to bananas uh, and now yes, we yes. see that especially in the let's say the second tier economies the chinese competitors are taking most of the market shares because the technology gap is not so big anymore. The quality is yeah. much, much better. But still, the price is uh, half the price of the German machine or the technology. And this is and a the real Chinese, problem. Yes. And the Chinese producers have a, a, a bigger advantage. They know their customers much better. And yeah. um, like... And, and and 15 years ago it was um, in a, it was different, but now they basically um, are more able to adapt to the customers' wishes. Before it was uh, for the German enterprises, it was very simple. They just were developing the best product they could, mm -hmm. and there was no competition, so yeah. they could it sell was. it easily. Exactly. But now. But now there's one example of a, a three thousand four hundred dollar uh, e car, which um, um, which was was developed by Americans, by G General Motors, and by Chinese, and that's actually the most successful car in China, mm. because it's a very small four seater smart like car, and actually the idea is the additional idea idea was the smart. But uh, the, the founder of, 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 of Smart, Mr. Hayek, he actually wanted a cheap um, city, electric city car. But then he cooperated with Daimler and they wanted to have a small, expensive, um, uh, um, um, normal engine car. Yeah. So, and, and the smart, smart lost about 4 billion over the years. Oh, it's a and, good case and, study. And it's, a, yes, and it's about focusing what do the con consumers want? Mm. And, uh, yeah. 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 Um, uh, um, but the engineers are saying, nah, that's not a real car. It's more like a motorbike mm. and with a, with a, with a, a shell. Um, but the customers want this kind of car, so I, I please cannot, produce it. I, I cannot yeah. agree more. Also from, let's say, operational business experience, I see when I send an inquiry for, let's say, a technical solution to a Chinese company, I will get within two hours latest a reply by WeChat or WhatsApp from the sales manager. Yes. In yes. Germany, I have to wait for three weeks before, if I'm lucky, somebody contacts me after I have sent an email to the info at company .de address. Yes, That's right. I mean, it's, I use drastic words. Uh, many German companies are sleeping, you know. They are, either they are just too busy and they have a huge order backlog they are working on. But in terms of receptiveness, in terms of yes. in terms of 
as you say, listening to the customer needs. Uh, it's very engineering driven and you buy what we have or we are not interested. Yeah? And it's actually they're right in a market economy as a private enterprise. They can sleep as long as they want. Yeah. But please don't complain that the others are not sleep. Exactly. That's a very simple game. So, uh, um, and uh, if the others are faster, then um, they are good only, uh, yeah, good luck. So if you either you want to stay competitive, then you will have to work harder. If mm -hmm. not, then uh, you're probably going to lose your business. That's a very simple game. But uh, um, uh, it's no exit to start complaining and then asking the government to implement pressure and so on and so on. That's not how the world is working. Very you can true. implement some rules, but that's only a frame. Yeah. Um, the main, in, 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 a, in a modern economy, the main work has to be done by the enterprises. If talking they about, are not competitive, they are not competitive. Basically. Talking about rules and regulation, I'd like to touch yes. the last uh, subject here, and that is on, let's say, sustainability of supply chains as a broader yes. uh, topic. Uh, yes. We have heard many cases where China is, uh, uh, or people are saying China is not complying to ethical supply chain yes. regulations, yes. Uh, violation of human rights, etc., child labor environmental pollution and all that stuff. Uh, and we hear different voices from China. There are some examples. You mentioned one earlier on where China agreed to stop uh, sales of coal-fired power plants, which is a move into the right direction for CO2 reduction. Um, but in general, in, in the Western countries, we have the perception China is still one of the greatest polluter or the greatest violator because that is the only reason they can produce ch such cheap products. Uh, where do you see China going in this, let's say, discussion about ethical business? It's very interesting because China is the greatest polluter and the biggest environmentalist at the same time. Mm. China is world leader in uh, coal-produced electricity and it's world leader in uh, um, solar energy, so solar wind renewable energy, energy mm. and in, in uh, water, water yeah. energy. So that they are both at the same time. And that's actually very important that we understand mm. uh, um, that um, uh, China is not only one side, it's not only uh, black, but it's black and white at the same time. And, um, uh, and this is not gonna change soon because it's simply not possible to stop uh, to produce electricity from coal from one to another day. That's not possible for China. They can they can continue to work um, um, to put to press the share of coal in the overall uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, um, production of electricity um, mm -hmm. to press it down step by step, but that takes time. Yeah, for sure. And um, so, um, therefore, we need to. Yeah, yeah, that was please. one just to, to throw in an idea which I just came up from my mind from one of the previous interviews which I had with another uh, expert with Para Kana. You probably know him as well. He said, sure. you know, all this discussion about China, it's there is a permanent contradiction. And the example you just gave uh, is another example where China is, yes. and it will not be either or, or China is not black or white. And you will find, right. if you do a study, you can find numbers which is supporting A or B, whichever you choose. So it's a it's a question of uh, political will, which direction do we want to go? And then it takes yes. time to say, and China, they have all the time in the world as the history shows. Yes, yes. That's a, that's a very important point for them. It's not so important if they, if they are world leader in 2030 or 2035, mm. as long as uh, they know they're going into this direction. That's 100% okay. clear. Whenever someone um, writes an article where China is only good or mm. only bad, you have to become suspicious. <laughs> it's always it's always a balance. And yeah. um, you see this, um, and, and that's um, especially about new technology. Mm, new true. technology only ha always have, has big advantages on one side and 
also these big disadvantages. Yeah, a car can be very dangerous, but on the on the long run, the car had more advantages and disadvantages. We are not. And so, what on... we need to do, what what we need to do, we need to discuss the advantages and disadvantages yeah. of a technology in, instead of bad mouthing the whole technology. Mm, and, then, um, yeah. and then basically um, um, uh, making sure that we, we, we will not get this technology. Mm. We, need, we need to find out as, as soon as there's some new technology developing, developing, we need to find out what is the strengths of this technology for our society. What do we need yeah. and what are the weak points? Then we need to adapt it. It's very simple. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is a very uh, interesting and nice closing remark. You know, we will have ample opportunity over the next uh, decades to discuss that. And um, yes. but I don't, I don't want to close our our interview here without asking you because you have been living in China now for more than twenty years. Is there any kind of uh, lesson you you take for yourself? I mean, what you haven't expected? You said in the introductory, you said I was planning maybe for two three years and uh, now you're there for 20 plus. Uh, what is your message to the, to the audience? Uh, what's your experience? What have you been learning? What's, what's it take? Even the most fascinating progress is only one step to the next progress. Mm. So there's continuous progress. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. You never, you, it's impossible to reach the summit. Mm, true, and yeah. people who and people who have the feeling or who have the impression that they have reached the summit already and they look down on everyone else these people are very dangerous mm, as yeah. long as you look up you're in a very very good position i'd like to close with my favorite slogan saying there's always room for improvement isn't it Yes. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. even more simple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Frank, I would like to thank you very much. A very enlightening and interesting and deep discussion. I'm sure our, our audience will enjoy following some of your statements here. And uh, thank you very much yeah. indeed. Uh, I really enjoyed it that you um, having me and uh, hopefully um, many people are going to look uh, this mm -hmm. show and okay. uh, we'll learn about it. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.